Hey everyone, today we're exploring the ingenuity of early human transportation. From massive Greek siege engines to intricate ancient submarines, these are some of the most amazing vehicles ever designed. Let's start with number 15, the Greek trireme. The ancient Greek trireme was a remarkable vessel that stood out for its combination of grace, speed, and maneuverability, making it the most powerful warship of its era. Despite detailed artistic representations found on paintings, relief, and coins, many mysteries still surround the precise mechanics of the trireme, particularly its means of propulsion. Now, the term trireme itself has sparked some debate, while differing interpretations on whether it referred to the three men per oar or three oars per group, or three banks of oars. Reconstruction efforts led by experts like John Morrison and John Coates have shed light on the trireme's design. Morrison, a seasoned scholar in naval ancient history, collaborated with Coates, a naval architect, to construct a full-scale reproduction named Olympias in the 1980s. The project, supported by funding from British bankers and the Greek Navy, aimed to resolve controversies surrounding the trireme's configuration. Olympias, the reconstructed one, demonstrated the feasibility of the three-bank system. While later archaeological evidence might prompt modifications, the fundamental concept proved effective during sea trials. Excavations at Piraeus provided additional insights into the dimensions of these ancient triremes. Athenian triremes featured distinct tiers of oarsmen, each with specialized roles and names. The Thranites manned the uppermost tier, wielding longer oars and sometimes receiving extra pay for their efforts. Triremes could also harness the power of the wind using sails, strategically set on main and boat masts to aid in navigation, especially when maneuvering against the wind. Number 14. Assyrian Siege Towers Siege towers, utilized since the 11th century BC by ancient empires like the Assyrians and the Babylonians, represented a remarkable advancement in ancient warfare. Initially documented during the reign of Ashurnasirpal II in the Neo-Assyrian Empire, siege towers quickly gained prominence across the Mediterranean, exemplifying a mobile fortress capable of altering the dynamics of siege warfare. By the 8th century BC, during the Siege of Memphis, the Kingdom of Kush employed siege towers to house archers and slingers, demonstrating their widespread adoption. Notably, the Heliopolis utilized during the Siege of Rhodes in 305 BC stood as the largest siege tower of antiquity, towering up to 130 feet in height and over 65 feet in width. Manned by about 200 soldiers and equipped with catapults and ballista, these immense engines required sophisticated mechanisms like rack and pinion systems for movement. The rectangular structure of Assyrian siege towers, constructed primarily of wood and possibly reaching heights of up to 80 feet, featured multiple levels filled with soldiers prepared to breach fortifications. Arrow slits enabled archers to suppress defenders while advancing towards enemy walls, facilitated by protective animal hide roofs and shielding against projectiles and fire. The strategic impact of these towers was profound, fundamentally altering siege tactics by combining ground-level assaults with aerial capabilities, challenging defenders' traditional advantages of height and barriers. The Assyrian siege tower epitomized ancient weapon technology, embodying both power and expense in its construction. Despite its logistical challenges, though, including disassembly and reassembly at siege sites, the siege tower provided a decisive advantage to attacking forces. Number 13. The Curragh or Coracle The Curragh is an ancient Irish boat type known for its unique construction using animal skins or hides stretched over a wooden frame. Unlike traditional boats of its time, the Curragh used animal hides as a primary material for its hull and covering. It set it apart as a versatile vessel capable of navigating both sea and inland waters. Historically, its design had roots dating back to ancient times, possibly influenced by Neolithic settlers who arrived in Ireland using similar hide-covered boats. The construction has evolved over centuries, blending elements of hide-covered basketry and wooden shipbuilding techniques, and the use of hazel rods, salty twigs, and oxide insulation contributed to the Curragh's lightweight yet sturdy frame, ideal for maneuvering in shallow water. The Curragh represents a distinct tradition of Irish boat building, contrasting with wooden vessels commonly found in other regions. Its historical significance is underscored by accounts like St. Brendan's legendary voyage and medieval descriptions by writers like Gerald of Wales that highlight the widespread use of Curraghs in Ireland's coastal communities. Despite its ancient origins, the Curragh remains in the water today. Now, though, these old Irish boats are crafted with canvas instead of hides and serve as racing boats. Number 12. La Marquise 
The La Marquise, crafted in 1884 by De Dion, Bouton, and Trepardeau, stand as a remarkable relic from the dawn of the automobile era, distinct in its design and significance. What sets this antique vehicle apart from its contemporaries is not only its pioneering quadricycle structure, but also its innovative features that challenged conventions. Unlike the prevalent three-wheeled designs of the late 1800s, La Marquise sported a stable four-wheel layout, offering enhanced balance and maneuverability, a rarity in early automobile engineering. Another standout feature was its cloth-made roof, a departure from the open-top designs of early cars. In an era when automobiles resembled bicycles or tricycles with no roof, the inclusion of a protective covering was a notable innovation. This roof not only shielded passengers from the elements, but it also provided a more comfortable and enclosed cabin space, accommodating up to four occupants, a design aspect way ahead of its time. Despite its antiquity, though, it was not merely a static artifact, but a functional vehicle capable of achieving speeds of up to 38 miles an hour, a significant feat considering the technological limitations of its era. Its steam-powered engine required meticulous preparation with a lengthy 30-minute heating process before it could operate. The historical journeys of the La Marquise, including its participation in racing competitions and subsequent accolades at auctions, highlight its enduring legacy. Sold for record-breaking prices in the 21st century, it symbolizes a convergence of the automotive industry, technological innovation, and enduring craftsmanship. Despite looking like a tiny steam engine, the La Marquise's participation in racing events like the London to Brighton veteran car run, and even proved capable of navigating modern roads, showcased its timeless appeal and functional design. Number 11. Scythe's Chariots The Scythe's Chariot, a vehicular weapon of ancient warfare adorned with lethal scythe blades, represents a daring and perhaps even bizarre innovation on the battlefield. With scythe blades extending up to three feet from each side of its wheels, the scythe chariot aimed to carve through enemy ranks, creating chaos and disruption in its wake. Originally attributed to Persian ingenuity during the Greco-Persian Wars, it was envisioned as a strategic response to the challenges posed by Greek heavy infantry formations, known as hoplites. Its purpose was clear, though, to plow through enemy lines, cutting down combatants or creating openings for exploitation. However, despite its fearsome appearance and intended function, the scythe chariot had notable shortcomings. Maneuvering such a weapon required a disciplined and coordinated approach. Skilled infantry could effectively evade its onslaught by diverging and quickly reforming behind it, minimizing casualties and rendering the chariot's impact less effective. Historically, the scythe chariot found some success in Persian and Hellenistic armies but gradually faded from use. Its last recorded appearance was at the Battle of Zela in 47 BC, where it faced defeat at the hands of Roman strategies. In later Roman history, experimental variants of the scythe chariot emerged, featuring cataphract-style lancers mounted on agile horses. These adaptations aimed to enhance maneuverability and surprise tactics, highlighting ongoing attempts to refine and adapt the scythe chariot concept. Number 10. Pentaconter the Pentaconter, an ancient Greek galley dating back to the Archaic period, stands out as a fascinating and versatile vessel. What makes the Pentaconter particularly intriguing is its dual role as both a merchant ship and a warship, blurring the lines between trade, piracy, and naval warfare. This ancient galley was propelled by 50 oarsmen, positioned in a row of 25 on each side, offering impressive speed and maneuverability in the open seas. Unlike later warships, the Pentaconter typically lacked a full deck, earning it the nickname of Unfenced Vessel due to its open construction. This design feature not only facilitated ease of movement for rowers, but also made the ship adaptable for carrying troops, cargo, or engaging in naval combat. In Homer's epic accounts of the Trojan War, various ships with different oar configurations, including 50 oared vessels like the Pentaconter, are described. These ships played a critical role in both military operations and legendary voyages. Scholars estimate that the Pentaconters range from 93 to 110 feet in length, approximately 15 feet in width, and capable of achieving speeds of up to 9 knots. However, modern reconstructions suggest that these vessels might have been capable of higher speeds, highlighting advancing engineering and maritime capabilities of ancient Greek shipbuilders. The evolution of the Pentaconter into more sophisticated warships such as triremes and biremes underscores its foundational role in naval history. Its legacy persisted until the Hellenistic period, gradually supplanted by newer ship designs like the Lembus and Liburnians, which offered enhanced combat capabilities and strategic advantages. 
Number 9. Minoan Ships The Minoans, renowned for their maritime prowess, employed sophisticated construction methods to craft seaworthy composite ship hulls that were remarkably advanced for their time. What distinguishes Minoan shipbuilding is the innovative use of natural materials, particularly linen cloth and pine resin, to create a lightweight yet durable vessel, a technology that wouldn't resurface until the 1950s AD. The shipbuilding process involved constructing a wooden hull frame, onto which linen cloth was tightly applied. Pine resin, often mixed with pulverized granite, was then used to create a waterproof seal between the cloth and the wooden structure. This technique, although effective in achieving its water resistance, sometimes resulted in creaking due to the movement of planks. Nevertheless, it provided a solid, watertight structure. Another method employed by Minoan shipwrights was the use of strong mortise and tenon joints, a sophisticated carpentry technique. This approach ensured secure connections between planks, resulting in robust hulls capable of withstanding the rigors of long sea voyages. The application of linen cloth coated with pine resin offered numerous advantages over traditional wooden hulls. Not only did it reduce the overall weight of the vessel, but it also improved hydrodynamics, enabling greater speed and maneuverability. Shipwrights could resurface damaged areas by applying heat, a primitive form of hull maintenance akin to modern repair techniques. The Minoans' export of high-quality linen cloth akin to modern aerolinen in strength underscores their expertise in material science and maritime trade. Furthermore, the incorporation of metal powders into the hull, possibly for aesthetic reasons but with practical benefits, such as preventing barnacle buildup, reflects the Minoans' meticulous attention to both functionality and aesthetics in ship design. Number 8. The Boireau Machine the Boireau machine, an early experimental land ship developed in France during World War I, represents a pioneering attempt to address the challenges of trench warfare with a mobile, armored vehicle. Designed by French engineer Louis Boireau in 1914 and constructed in early 1915, the Boireau machine was intended to navigate the irregular terrain of battlefields, flattened barbed wire defenses, and traverse gaps in the landscape. The concept behind the machine was inspired by the immobility and hazards of trench warfare, which necessitated the development of vehicles capable of carrying weapons, shielding soldiers from enemy fire, and maneuvering over difficult terrain. The initial design of the machine featured a rhomboid-shaped structure with a single overhead track, resembling a skeleton tank without traditional armor. It employed a unique track system composed of six large parallel tracks arranged around a triangular motorized center driven by an 80-horsepower petrol engine. This configuration allowed the vehicle to flatten obstacles such as barbed wire and traverse trenches, demonstrating its potential utility in overcoming battlefield obstacles. Now, despite its innovative design, the machine faced significant challenges during testing. The vehicle was deemed too fragile and way too slow with limited maneuverability and steering. Reports highlighted issues with visibility, noise, vulnerability to enemy fire, and overall effectiveness in combat. These shortcomings led to the abandonment of the project in June 1915 as military leaders sought more viable alternatives. A second iteration of the Boireau machine was developed in 1916, featuring a more compact design with additional armor for the engine and driver compartment. This updated version attempted to address some of the original model's deficiencies, including steering control and overall mobility. However, testing revealed persistent issues with the speed and maneuverability, ultimately leading to the project's discontinuation. Moving on to number 7, Atakebune. The Atakebune, prominent Japanese warships of the 16th and 17th centuries, epitomized innovative naval efforts of Japan during the tumultuous Sengoku period. These vessels, notably the largest and most imposing among Japan's coastal fleets, were more akin to floating fortresses than really conventional warships. They played a pivotal role in the internal conflicts of feudal Japan, where regional rulers sought political control and unity through maritime dominance. These vessels, constructed during an era of intense competition among feudal lords, represented a fusion of naval prowess and military strategy. They were often crafted with iron cladding or reinforced superstructures, making them resilient against cannon fire and fire arrows. Notably, the legendary daimyo Oda Nobunaga oversaw the construction of large iron-covered Atakebune in 1578, known as Tekosen, or Iron Ships. These vessels, as described by Jesuit missionaries, embodied the ingenuity and ambition of Japanese naval engineering. However, the zenith of Atakebune innovation came under the rule of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who commissioned the fully iron-covered ships for the invasion of Korea. 
These vessels, adorned with gilded embellishments and towering structures, left a lasting impression on observers, including the Portuguese witnesses. Despite their impressive appearance, these ironclad ships faced practical challenges, such as structural deficiencies that compromised their durability and seaworthiness. Their role in pivotal naval engagements, such as the successful blockade at the mouth of the Kizu River in 1578, underscored their significance. However, the limitations of the Atakebune became apparent during the Japanese invasion of Korea, where they encountered formidable resistance from the Korean Navy's Panokseon ships. The superior firepower and sturdier structure of the Korean vessels exposed the vulnerabilities of the Atakebune, highlighting the evolving nature of naval warfare in East Asia. Number 6. Korean Turtle Ships the turtle ship, known as Geobukseon in Korean, was a remarkable warship employed by the Korean Joseon Navy from the early 15th century through the 19th. Originating as the Guiseon in the early 1400s, this precursor to the turtle ship made its debut in a mock battle with a Japanese warship mentioned in historical records. However, these early turtle ships fell out during use of times of relative peace, only to re-emerge with renewed purpose during the Japanese invasions of Korea from 1592 to 98. It was during this period that Admiral Yi Sun Yin, credited with designing the improved turtle ship, employed these formidable vessels to devastating effect against the Japanese. One of the mysteries surrounding the turtle ship is its alleged use of metal plating. While some historical accounts suggest ironclad armor, there is ongoing debate among historians regarding the authenticity of this claim. Contemporary sources from Si Yun Sin's era did not explicitly reference ironclad construction, and later assertions of metal armor may have emerged from 19th century Western interpretations. The turtle ship's defensive strategy was further augmented by the use of metal spikes on its roof to deter enemy boarding attempts. These spikes, covered with rice sacks or mats, served as a deterrent against Japanese tactics. Armed with an array of weapons, including the powerful cannons and arquebuses, the turtle ship proved to be a formidable adversary in naval combat. The inclusion of a dragon's head at the bow, equipped with a projector emitting toxic smoke, added a psychological dimension to the ship's warfare tactics, instilling fear in the Japanese adversaries. Number 5. War Elephants the War Elephant, a majestic and fearsome creature trained for combat, played a pivotal role in ancient warfare across various cultures and regions. These towering beasts, guided by skilled mahouts, served as formidable instruments of war, capable of charging through enemy ranks, instilling terror and altering the course of battles. In antiquity, war elephants were prominently utilized, especially in regions like ancient India, where they featured prominently in key battles. These colossal creatures, with their sheer power, could break enemy fortifications and strike fear into the hearts of forces. While their use was intermittent in ancient China, war elephants became fixtures in the armies of historical kingdoms in Southeast Asia, showcasing their enduring military significance. Throughout classical antiquity, war elephants found their way into the military strategies of diverse empires, from ancient Persia to the Hellenistic Greek states to the Roman Republic and Carthage in North Africa. The sight of war elephants on the battlefield was an example of the power and might of those ancient civilizations. The Mahout, responsible for controlling and directing the elephant, played a critical role in training the animals for battle. Utilizing special tools like the elephant goad, Mahouts taught the elephants to navigate obstacles, charge at enemies, and trample adversaries. War elephants served diverse military purposes beyond combat. They would transport heavy material and provide a stable platform for archers to unleash volleys of arrows, offering a strategic advantage in battle. Despite their formidable reputation, though, war elephants had notable weaknesses. When wounded or if their mahout was killed, elephants could panic and run amok, causing chaos on the battlefield. Clever tactics such as severing their trunks or using fast skirmishers armed with javelins, they were employed to disrupt elephant units in classical antiquity. The legacy of war elephants does underscore their historical value on the battlefield. In Southeast Asia, their use persisted into the 19th century due to geographical challenges that favored their mobility over traditional cavalry. Even in colonial contexts, such as British forces in India, specialized elephant batteries were used to haul large siege artillery over challenging terrain showing their adaptability of these majestic beasts in military campaigns. Number 4. Cugnots Fardier Nicolas Joseph Cugnots' steam-powered vehicle, created in 1769, represents a bizarre yet pioneering chapter in the evolution of automotive history. 
This early contraption, known as the Fardier à Vapeur, was essentially the world's first automobile, conceived during an era when horse-drawn carriages still dominated transportation. Cugnot's invention was born out of military necessity, intended to haul heavy artillery to battlefields using steam power. The vehicle, equipped with a large copper boiler that generated steam from firewood, featured a rudimentary steam engine driving the front wheel through a series of pistons and notched discs, a mechanism akin to the inner workings of a clock. This ambitious creation, although revolutionary for its time, was beset with practical challenges that bordered on the comical. One aspect of the steam vehicle was its lack of effective controls. With no brakes and an unwieldy steering system, it was far from user-friendly. Weighing nearly three tons and having a top speed of just over two miles an hour, the vehicle proved to be more of cumbersome experiment than a practical means of transportation. The bizarre nature of its invention was epitomized by its maiden voyage, which famously ended in what is believed to be the world's first automobile accident, when the Fardier collided with a wall during a test run. Well, despite its shortcomings, Cugnot's steam vehicle laid the groundwork for future innovations. Interestingly, it left a lasting legacy that reverberated. Some of the fundamental concepts pioneered by Cugnot was converting a steam engine motion into rotary motion for propulsion. They were revisited and refined in the 19th century and eventually contributed to the development of modern cars. Despite facing financial hardships and the abandonment of the project by the French army, Cugnot's contributions were recognized by King Louis XV, who awarded him a pension for his innovative efforts. The tale of Nicolas Joseph Cugnot and his steam-powered vehicle underscores the eccentricity and audacity of early automotive pioneers, despite their quirks and limitations. Cugnot's Fardier à Vapeur represents a pivotal moment in transportation history, a bold step towards a future defined by mechanized mobility. Number 3. Tesseract Contaries the Tesseract Conteris, or 40 Road Galley, stands out as one of the most extraordinary and enigmatic vessels of antiquity. Constructed in the 3rd century BC, this ship was described by ancient sources such as Calazinus of Rhodes, Antonius, and Plutarch, offering glimpses into its immense size and specifications. The name 40 derives from the number of rowers per vertical section of oars, rather than the total number of oars. According to ancient accounts, it was an awe-inspiring spectacle, measuring over 420 feet in length, making it the largest human-powered vessel ever recorded. Its width was reported to be 55 feet, with a height reaching over 72 feet to the gunwale and 80 feet from the highest part of the stern to the waterline. What truly distinguished the Tesseract Conteris was its propulsion system, which evolved an unprecedented number of rowers, more than 4,000 in total arranged in 40 rows. This arrangement likely contributed to the vessel's immense size and provided the necessary power to propel such a massive ship. Well, despite its impressive dimensions and appearance, it was primarily a prestige vessel rather than an effective warship. Plutarch's accounts suggest that the ship was intended for display and exhibition, lacking practicality for actual naval warfare. The vessel was more akin to a floating palace designed to showcase the wealth and power of the Ptolemaic Egypt. The construction and operation of it posed significant engineering challenges, too. The immense weight and size made it difficult to maneuver, especially in naval combat. Furthermore, the logistics of maintaining such a vast crew and provisioning the ship for extended voyages would have been daunting tasks. The Tesseract Conteris likely featured an innovative catamaran design with two distinct hulls joined by a deck, providing stability and adding deck space for crew and equipment. But despite its grandeur, the Tesseract Conteris was not without practical shortcomings. Plutarch notes the ship's challenges in movement, describing it as resembling a stationary edifice on land rather than a nimble warship. Well, the vessel's immense size and weight would have made it vulnerable to adverse weather, too. Number 2. Viking Longships the enduring effectiveness of the Viking longships during the Norse expansion of the 8th to the 11th centuries are subjects of fascination and scholarly debate. These iconic vessels, with their distinctive dragon-headed prows and formidable row of shields along the sides, represents more than mere tools of war and exploration. They embody the ingenuity, adaptability, and strategic vision of the Viking seafarers. One of the key factors contributing to their success was its remarkable combination of speed, durability, and versatility. Unlike many contemporary vessels, Viking longships were designed to navigate a wide range of maritime conditions, from open seas to shallow coastal waters. The shallow draft of these ships, dipping less than a yard below the waterline, allowed for more agile maneuvering. 
The propulsion methods employed by Viking longships further contributed to their effectiveness. They were equipped with sails and rows of oars. These vessels could harness the power of the wind for swift movement when the conditions were favorable, while still maintaining the ability to navigate and maneuver efficiently even on calm days. Navigational techniques used by the Viking sailors remain a subject of speculation and ongoing research. While there is limited archaeological evidence supporting the use of navigational tools such as compasses or sunstones, scholars do suggest that Vikings relied on a combination of celestial observations, natural phenomena, and environmental cues. But beyond their functional attributes, Viking longships were also designed to evoke psychological impact. The menacing appearance created by the dragon-headed prows, colorful sails, and row of shields along the side served not only as symbols of power and prestige, but also tools of intimidation. The sight of a fleet of longships approaching would instill fear in those witnessing their arrival. Modern reconstructions and experimental archaeology have shed further light on the technological sophistication of these shipbuilding techniques. Efforts to reconstruct longships using traditional methods have revealed insights into their construction, design principles, and seaworthiness, highlighting their enduring legacy and influence on subsequent shipbuilding tech. Number 1. Submarines The history of submarines reaches far back into antiquity, with early concepts and designs dating back to ancient times, long before the modern steel behemoths we associate with submarines today. The idea of exploring underwater realms and conducting clandestine operations beneath the waves has captured human imagination for millennia. Legends and stories from ancient civilizations provide tantalizing glimpses of early submersible devices. One such tale involves a Mughal poet Amir Kusaru's description of Alexander the Great descending into the sea using a diving bell during the Siege of Tyr in 332 BC. Although these accounts remain unverified, the concept of exploring underwater environments and conducting activities beneath the surface has ancient roots. The first confirmed building of a submarine happened in 1620 by Cornelius Drebbel, a Dutch inventor in the service of King James I of England. Drebbel's submersible was a pioneering achievement for its time, utilizing oars for propulsion and featuring innovative technologies such as a quicksilver barometer to measure depth and a chemical process involving saltpeter to refresh the air supply and provide oxygen. Subsequent advancements in submarine technology emerged in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, with inventors like Denis Papin and Yefem Nikonov exploring military applications of these vessels. Nikonov's military submarine, commissioned by Peter the Great of Russia in 1720, aimed to approach enemy ships undetected and launch combustible mixtures from underwater tubes, an early example of stealth tactics in naval warfare. One of the most iconic early submarines was the Turtle, designed by David Bushnell during the War of American Independence in 1775. The Turtle was the first military submarine built in America and the first to be used in naval warfare. Showcasing features such as an underwater propeller, internal instruments painted with bioluminescent foxfire for visibility, and foot-operated water ballast for depth control. Bushnell's creation represented a significant leap forward in submarine technology, and it demonstrated the potential for clandestine operations. Throughout history, inventors and engineers continued to refine submarine designs, incorporating propulsion systems, advanced materials, and navigation instruments. Robert Fulton's Nautilus, developed in 1800, based on American engineer Robert Fulton's design, was one of the earliest successful combat subs. These early submarines laid the groundwork for future advancements in underwater warfare and exploration, influencing subsequent generations of submarine designers and engineers. Thanks for watching everyone, I'll see you next time. Thank you to our channel members.